April Von Garrett, and this is Amplify Baltimore. It's winter 2012, and on any given evening, over 4,000 men, women, and children are homeless on the streets of our city. Today, we will visit with Catholic Charities and Healthcare for the Homeless, two organizations who are committed to making homelessness a brief experience in our city. Today, we're here with Marianne O'Donnell, the Director of Community Services with Catholic Charities. Marianne, thanks for being with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. What is the mission of Catholic Charities? Well, April, the mission of Catholic Charities is to provide services and care to Marylanders in need. And we do that in the city through uh, two major programs, and we do it in some of the counties and some other programs. Okay. When people think of the name Catholic Charities, they probably think that you only serve Catholics in Baltimore. Tell us a little bit about the people you serve. That's a great question. Catholic Charities is open to serve anyone who is in need. We serve um, people from all religious denominations, mm. ethnic backgrounds, anyone who has a need, they come to our doors, no questions asked. Wonderful. What are the numbers of people you're serving who are living in poverty in Baltimore? Here in the city in our programs, we've been serving between 15, 1,700 a year. Mm -hmm. And we do that predominantly through emergency services. That's sort of our entree mm -hmm. where people come for food, clothing, shower. And as we can serve them by giving them a warm meal, um, clothing that they might need, we also use that as an entree into helping them to change their life, giving mm -hmm. them hope that we might also be able to find housing for them, employment, which are really important things to move out of poverty. Sure. Okay. Your organization provides a number of programs that help low-income families and individuals come out of poverty and it's really with the goal of creating self-sufficiency in those individuals. Can you tell us about a few of those? Sure. My Sister's Place Women's Center and my Sister's Place Lodge here in the city provide a safe haven for women to come in and to be assessed for what benefits or services they may be okay. eligible for in the city. Mm -hmm. And then we also help to get them housed if they need housing, mm -hmm. get them mental health services, and then eventually try to get anyone who can be employed, employed, whether it be that we help to develop skills that they have mm -hmm. or if they have no skills, we'll get them into a skilled training program. Mm -hmm. Because we all know once someone is housed and employed, it's a little easier to move towards self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. And then we also operate the Our Daily Bread Employment Center, where mm -hmm. we not only feed individuals, but we use that as an opportunity to get people in the door mm -hmm. and have the resources available and the hope there for an individual that in any day when they're ready to move the next step, they can basically get help with housing. We have an employment program. We have one program that is a week-long program that actually helps people get a job right after they have finished that program. Mm. We'll get them interviews with employers and then hopefully they will get employed. And then we have the Christopher Place Employment Academy, which I think you're going to hear some more about later, which is a very structured residential program, mm -hmm. 18 month program for formerly homeless men. Mm -hmm. And last year we were able to get close to 600 individuals employment in Baltimore City. How can the people of Baltimore help you with your mission? Well, we depend very heavily on volunteers. We could not do any of these programs without having volunteers to help serve our food, teach some of our classes. We need employers who are willing yes. to, you know, interview and help by employing some of the clients that we serve with. So we have a number of opportunities available and we can only do this if we all do it together. Absolutely. Well, I can't thank you enough for how you and Catholic Charities help us to amplify Baltimore. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And next we'll talk with Rhonda English, the Residential <laughs> Operations Supervisor of My Sister's Place Lodge. We're here at My Sister's Place Lodge with Rhonda English, who is the Residential Operations Supervisor. Rhonda, thank you so much for being with us here today. You're welcome. How long have you been in this position? Um, this actual position, about four years now. Four years now. Mm -hmm. I had the uh, good fortune to stay here overnight to see yes. how this facility operates. Tell us a little bit about the women you serve and how they come to you. Um, the women that we serve come to us. Um, usually they come through a referral process through the um, Department of Social Services, through maybe one of the um, hospitals or one of the local institutions or recovery houses, and they come through um, and do an intake with our intake coordinator. And then after about a week, they're at home. Yes, they are. They are at <laughs> home, they're at home. What's the general state of the women that you serve when they come to you? I would say fragile, mm. um, unsure, afraid, um, no direction. Mm -hmm. So what kind of services do you provide them while they're staying in 
my sister's place lodge? Um, one of our biggest services that we provide is case management. And okay. under case management, um, they receive help. Um, some of them need help with um, clearing, um, help with the judicial system where they might have um, need to work on getting expungements. Some of them need to be engaged with um, other service providers to receive mental health um, assistance. Some of them come in with no income. So we assist them through the um, case management who works on assisting them and like I said, giving them referrals, um, telling them where to go and how to go about um, getting those services. We uh -huh. help with everyday things. Um, some come in don't have any education, too limited education. They uh, get them into other programs that help with um, a basic um, adult, basic education, uh -huh. GED programs. Some of them do um, go to college. Uh -huh. um, so we provide so you're a working lot of... with the Pratt and you're yep. working with the school system to make sure that they get the resources that they yes. need to be self-sustaining adults. Yes, we do. Okay. My Sister's Place Lodge provides a home for women who were formerly homeless but also mentally ill. How do you connect with these women and how many women do you serve a year? Well, our capacity is 27 women. Okay. Um, we do have a waiting list. I bet. And I would say maybe for the fiscal year, if I'm not mistaken, I may be a little off with the numbers, we might have served about 52 women mm. um, within a year. Mm -hmm. um, what is the duration of time a woman can stay at My Sister's Place Lodge? The transitional program here is a two-year program, mm -hmm. but some women, they leave before then. Mm -hmm. They receive permanent housing. Depends on the, the readiness depends, and motivation mm -hmm. of each individual. It depends on the individual, mm -hmm. but the long term is two years. Okay. What is the biggest misperception that people have of the women in your care? I would say the biggest um, misconception is that um, they're lazy. Mm. They don't want to do anything. They're always looking for a handout. I'm not only women, but anyone who suffers with any type of mental illness. I just think it's a lot of miseducation out there. And because if you don't know and you're afraid to ask, you assume. What would you tell the people of Baltimore they should do to really support this population? First of all, I would um, become educated. I would um, visit different institutions that provide services. Until you really get into it, you really don't know. So I would say the first thing is become educated. Then find a program or some type of institution that will allow you to volunteer there where you can get the hands-on experience. And then make it a, um, go out there, once you've done those two things, you go out there and become an advocate for the program or for the issues that are at hand with those um, individuals who do suffer from mental illness. Mm -hmm. And you do that so beautifully. I I'm love just, it. Yeah, I, I know you do. <laughs> and, and this population here, they love you and they really appreciate the stability and the services that you provide them and the familial atmosphere that's mm -hmm. in this space. Yes. So I thank you so much, Rhonda, for everything that you do to amplify Baltimore and to help t to eradicate homelessness in our city. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. And next we'll talk with a My Sister's Place Lodge client, Tammy Wilgus. I'm honored to be here with My Sister's Place Lodge client, Tammy Wilgus. Tammy, thanks for being with us today. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> Tammy, tell me your story. Tell me a little bit about what brought you to being a resident here at My Sister's Place Lodge. Well, it was no fault of my own. I, um, I became homeless to a, a landlord who wasn't paying his bills. Mm. And due to that, it put me on the street. My goodness. How did you find out about this particular program? Um, through a, a clinic I was going to. Mm -hmm. So you were working with another service that was trying to provide you with the resources you needed to get back on your feet and they recommended this particular program? Yes. Tell me a little bit about what you're learning here in this environment that's going to help you get back on your feet. Well, um, they're teaching me how to budget my money. Oh, very important. Um, they're letting me be myself. What does um, well, that I'm mean? I'm learning how to be myself. Okay, tell me a little bit um, more about what that means. Um, well, I'm kind of a shy person. Right. Quiet. Uh huh. And um, they're teaching me how to be a little bit more outspoken. Mm hmm. What skills are you gaining in this environment that you believe will help you once you leave My Sister's Place Lodge and secure your own home and secure uh, stable employment? I'm going back to school. Huh? To get my GED. Okay. And after that, I'll go to college and hopefully get a good job. Do you think you would have done at that? At my age. <laughs> Do you think you would have done that before coming here? 
No. That's mm -hmm. great. That's mm -hmm. great. How has this program made a difference in your life? Mm. Well, they, they show me that, um, well, they show me a lot of love, and that's something I, I didn't have in my life. Mm. Um, hope. And, uh, so. Love and hope. Mm. Well, that's great. There's no better way to amplify Baltimore than to be <laughs> in an environment that can provide you with that. So, Tammy, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, mm. and thank you for all the ways you're amplifying Baltimore. You're welcome. We're here at the Our Daily Bread Employment Center with its director, Sabri Akinyele. Sabri, thank you so much for being with us today. It's, it's a pleasure. Now, we know that this place does a host of programs to help people who are homeless and otherwise um, facing issues with regard to poverty and getting their lives back in order, but I want to talk to you today about the Christopher Place program. Can you tell me a little bit about the structure of the program and how many men you serve in a year? Christopher Place Employment Academy is an 18-month residential program mm -hmm. for formerly homeless men. And it's, it's a part of our Daily Bread Employment Center. Mm -hmm. And it, when you look at our Daily Bread Employment Center, it's a comprehensive program. Mm -hmm. So people come every day and we're kind of known for our meals. We've been serving meals for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And what the um, Catholic Charities recognize that while we can feed people every day and we do that no matter what the circumstances are, we wanted to do more. Okay. So with Christopher Place, we recognize that homeless men need a place where they can heal, yes. both uh, mentally, spiritually, and, and physically heal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it takes, it takes a, it's a process. If you look at our mission statement, it says that we invite men to engage in a process of change that moves men from being homeless to permanent stable living. Mm -hmm. So the men that come to Christopher Place come with wanting to make that change. That's what we ask. Are you ready? Are you motivated to make the change? So what we offer them is a place that they can get their basic needs met. Mm -hmm. In that structure during the process of 18 months, there are classes in anger management, coping mm. skills, family reunification, mm. and of course recovery, recovery, and recovery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and the goal is for them to get their life back. Sure. You know, that's the healing process. Mm -hmm. While many of the men have had jobs, they haven't been able to maintain the jobs. Sure. So the other part of our mission is to prepare men to obtain and maintain full-time employment. By providing them with those life skills exactly. that they need to be able to exactly. have that kind of routine and structure in their exactly. life. Exactly. Okay. And it's a family. Mm -hmm. You know, I, this, is, this building is 53,000 53, square feet, okay. yet it's their home. So the Christopher Place men are residents here. Mm -hmm. We don't refer to them as clients. Mm -hmm. they, are re they are residents in the program. And they live here and they take care of this building and they take ownership of the building. Sabri, so what is the impact of your program on the men you serve? You know, what I really see is that the men get to love themselves. And I know you may say, well, that sounds kind of hokey, but it is actually what they start feeling good about themselves, that they can, what we say, reclaim their life. Hmm. And what you see is them saying, okay, well, you know what, maybe I worked in warehousing for a while, but now I want to do something else. I want to maybe get a, a skilled job. I maybe want to get my CDL license now. I may want to go to school for computers or construction or, you know, even go to college college. We have men that have gone to college and got their AA degrees and are working to get their actual bachelor's degree. So the impact is on a person becoming whole. So that's what makes it special. That's what makes it well, special. Well, I knew you were special because I wouldn't be here interviewing you if you weren't <laughs> special, but I cannot thank you enough for sharing the mission of this wonderful place and this particular program in Christopher Place is always at the top of the list when folks talk about programs that actually work. And so. we're proud of that. We're proud of that. But let me just say this. It doesn't work without volunteers. Tell us how they can get in contact with you to do so. If they call our main number, 443-986-9000, okay. uh, uh -huh. and say they're interested in volunteering, we will put them in touch with our volunteer office. That's fantastic. Well, I cannot thank you and Catholic Charities and Our Daily Bread and, of course, Christopher Place for all that you do to amplify the men of Baltimore. Thank you so much. Thanks, April. And next we'll talk with Christopher Place resident Norman Bull. Happy to be here today with Christopher Place resident Norman Bull. Norman, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Are you a resident of Baltimore City? Did you grow up here? Yes, I did. What neighborhood did you grow up in? Park Heights area. Park Heights area. Yes. Where did you go to school? Northwestern High School. Northwestern High School. Tell us how you got here. Well, I got here from 
going from house to house. Mm. You know, I got tired of it. Eventually, I went to Beans and Bread mm -hmm. and asked about any program they could assist me in with, uh, cause I've been, I'm homeless going from house to house. And they said, yes, you look like you fit Christopher's place. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how would I do, how would I sign up? They said, go to Our Daily Bread and ask about Christopher's place. So when I went down there, Miss Michelle, she interviewed me and she asked me, am I clean? Have I been clean for 30 days? Have I been alcohol free? And I told her, yes. And then they, it was a process we had to go through where they asked questions, how did I end up here? What can I do to better myself through going through this program? What's my goals? And I had some strong goals. I was uh, cooking at Stevenson University. Ah, okay. As a, at first I was a grill cook. Mm -hmm. Then I moved up. I was there for a couple months and they needed a cook, so I was the right one for it. They asked me, did I want to cook? And I said, yes, I'm down for new new uh, adventures. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so I'm going to take you back, right? Yes. Because you said you were chronically homeless. Yes. When did that become a part of your life? At what age? I started when I was 16 in the group homes. I went from a group home mm -hmm. to uh, foster homes. Mm -hmm. Then I was 18 years old, right. and I asked my caseworker, could I uh, sign out the system? Mm -hmm. So we went to court, they signed me out. Mm -hmm. So with the position that you had at Stevenson University, you still have that position? Yes. You do, so by coming here and making the transition in the Christopher's Place with the rules and regulations and the structure that the program is giving you, you were able to kind of keep that position and actually still grow in that. Right. Tell me what other things you're getting by being here. Well, I'm going through anger management classes. Uh, I I was down in the kitchen helping with this, uh, help cook meals mm -hmm. for uh, dinner for the fellas. Um, they, they're gonna help me get my serve safe certification and I will be going to culinary classes when they begin. How long have you been a member of this, of this class? I've been a member here for two and a half months. Two and a half months, so yes. it's very new to you. Yeah. What do you hope to gain once you're completed? I hope to gain a new me, mm. just a, a better person than what I seen when I first came here. Mm -hmm. you know, just Who a, was that person? It was a Norman boy that was struggling. He needed help, he needed guidance. He needed help with his anger management to move on for a better person in life. Mm -hmm. You feel like you're getting there? Yes. I feel like you're getting there too. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much for sharing your personal story. And I'm so I'm glad that you were able to find this particular program that will help you. I'm a big fan of Stevenson University, so I'm sure that the president and all the people who work at Stevenson University while watching this interview will be very proud of you. But I'm sure that the people of Baltimore are also very proud for the way that you amplify Baltimore and give us faith that people in your position with some assistance and help can really acclimate and do whatever you need to do to be successful in society. So thank you so much for the ways that you amplify Baltimore. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And next, we're off to health care for the homeless with its president, Kevin Lindemann. We're in the pediatric clinic at Healthcare for the Homeless with its new president and CEO, Kevin C. Lindemood, who is also a friend of mine in the spirit of full disclosure. Kevin, thanks for having us here Hi, today. Hi, April. Thanks for coming down today. Okay, these are amazing digs. If I had to come to the hospital, I'd want to come here. Well, we've tried, you know, a lot of people look at this and they say, okay, are you being too opulent, uh -huh. right? And, but we believe that people experiencing homelessness should have access to the same high quality services that each of us deserves. And it's extraordinary. With this building, we've been able to do that. We've tripled the size of our previous space over at 111 Park Avenue. Uh -huh. uh, we've added services, uh, dental care, uh -huh. pediatric and adolescent services that you see, the, the waiting room for which you see around you yes. now. Uh, we've expanded our medical mental health services, addiction treatment, and outreach. We try to provide comprehensive resources to get people off the streets and, and back into the mainstream. So healthcare for the homeless is a national movement. 
and then we have Health Care for the Homeless Baltimore. Tell us a little bit about the national flavor of Health Care for the Homeless and then why and when it came to Baltimore. In the late 70s and early 80s, communities around the country started wrestling with people living uh, under bridges, on park yeah. benches, going into emergency rooms with all of their belongings yes. on their backs. Yes. Um, there was a guy uh, in New York, Dr. Philip Brickner, who was doing this work at a hospital, mm -hmm. and he was friends or, or became acquainted with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Oh, yes. uh, the story goes that the head of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and his wife were in New York, hmm. and the wife literally had to step over somebody oh, who was word. lying on the street hmm. and said, what is going on here? Sure. Seriously, b back in the, the late 70s and early 80s, the country hadn't seen this. Right. And the person she was talking to said, you need to talk to Dr. Brickner. And what was born from that conversation uh. was a national demonstration project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh -huh. Healthcare for the Homeless in Baltimore was one of 19 projects that were wow. funded nationally. Uh -huh. uh, the, the story goes, if you've seen one Healthcare for the Homeless program, you've seen one Healthcare for the Homeless program. They were right. all designed very differently. Okay. Um, this program in Baltimore started out v very modestly mm -hmm. in My Sister's Place, a, mm -hmm. a day program for homeless women, sure. and Christopher Place, a shelter mm -hmm. for and men. And we just interviewed them today. And you <laughs> in interviewed them earlier today. Catholic Charities has been, uh, ha have been an incredible partner mm -hmm. uh, with Healthcare for the Homeless. What year did you guys come to Baltimore? That was 1985. Wow. So tell me what the population has looked like over time. How have you seen some changes in the demographics? Sure. Um, ho homelessness began in the late 70s and, as, and early 80s primarily as a phenomenon among single adults. And here in Baltimore, uh, we treated primarily single adult African-American men. Mm. Uh, not surprisingly, because public policy had virtually ignored single adults. Mm -hmm. Not eligible for Medicaid in Maryland and in most states. Right. Uh, not eligible for financial assistance, except under very limited uh, conditions. And so, not surprisingly, single adults were more likely to experience homelessness. Right. What we've really seen change over the last 26 years, and what we're seeing now, I, I think the entire community and the entire country is wrestling with this. We're seeing more women. A yes. third of our clients today at Healthcare for the Homeless are women. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more children. We're seeing more entire intact families mm. that are coming into an already overwhelmed service system. Sure. Um, not, not really sure where to turn. Right. And unfortunately, there aren't sufficient resources in this community or in most communities right. to provide the kind of help people need. Right. Well, I, I have a, a personal story. As you know, we met several years ago when I was facing a, a similar situation with an aunt who was chronically mentally ill and yeah. had an acute breakdown and you guys helped her get placement. She's and on you medication. Her as well. yes. yes, and our family, thank goodness. But your organization was critical as well as some other organizations that you consistently work with. Talk to me a little bit about how important it is for people to understand how mental health is really shaping the homeless population as well. Oh my goodness, a, a third of our clients, a little more, has a major Axis One mental health diagnosis, mm. and you're certainly familiar with that. Um, bipolar disorder, yes. major clinical depression, yes. schizophrenia. Um, more, more troublingly, troublingly, a full quarter of healthcare for the homeless clients are duly diagnosed with both mental health and addiction. Mm. Uh, an even greater percentage are triply diagnosed with mental health addiction and some kind of complicated medical problem. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the service systems still tend to point people in the other direction. Right. And you found this directly, oh, yes, right? Someone mm -hmm. goes to an addiction treatment provider and they say, wait a minute, your problem is that you're hearing voices, you need to go yes. over there. Yes. And someone goes to a mental health provider and they say, wait, your problem is that you're addicted. Right. And it's like this, and the sure. client doesn't really know where to go. Sure. Healthcare for the Homeless has tried to provide dual diagnosis services mm -hmm. uh, capable of meeting an individual's comprehensive needs to get them to get them off the so street. So tell me, how many people are you seeing in a day, in a month, in a year? Oh my goodness, 250 different people a day oh. over the course of a year. Uh, last year, we saw close to 7,000 different people. Uh, we're still tabulating the numbers, but sure. we'll have more than 60,000 patient visits with them. So we're seeing them each nine or 10 times on average, which by design is exactly what we want to do. I love the way that you and all the other organizations that I talked to, to today really work together. Um, and I think that's a really good witness as far as anybody that's working on any particular issue in our city. So thank you so much for your leadership on that. Thank and you, I thank April. you for being one of the best Baltimore amplifiers we've ever had. Oh, you are very kind. All right, thank you, you are very so kind. Much. It takes the entire community. Yes, it does. But you help us and you steer the way. So thank you so much. I'm here today with Wendell and Paulette Muldrow, a couple who met here at Healthcare for the Homeless and former clients, 
who now work with the organization with God's Choice Clothing Ministry that distributes clothing to those in need every Tuesday from 1 until 3. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to talk to you both a little bit about what brought you to health care for the homeless. What were the circumstances in your life that brought you here? Well, I became homeless because of a drug and alcohol addiction. How long were you addicted? Oh, I've been addicted uh, more than 25 years. Mm -hmm. And how old were you when you came to health care for the homeless? Uh, in my 40s. In your 40s. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how long have you been clean? I've been clean now for four years. Wonderful. And how about you, Miss Paulette? Um, well, my situation, I was, um, I had lost everything. Um, got addicted to drugs. But when I lost my job, I lost my home. I lost everything. And I, I wanted to get myself back together. And it wasn't long for me because I knew the, the morals that my mom instilled in me, that there really wasn't a good thing for me to do what I was doing. But I just wanted to see what the other side was like. Mm. And I, I think I did that for almost two years. Mm. And, um, and I called, cried out to my brother because I knew he was in the same circle doing the same things. And he told me about health care for the homeless. And when he told me about it, I was like, well, what kind of place is it? You know, he said, don't get discouraged because of the name. He said they help a lot of people, anybody and everybody. He said, if you really want the help, that's the place to go. And so he um, gave me bus fare, told me who to ask for. Um, the people, they act like they was expecting me. Um, they welcomed me with open arms. They made me feel comfortable and, and relaxed. And uh, this one young lady, my intake person was Miss Kia, and I was real nervous and scared. And she said, oh, don't worry about it, baby. Most of the people here for the same thing. They get their life together. So she takes me downstairs for intake, and this man is in the elevator. And he's talking about, um, I'm in the elevator with the two most beautiful women in the world. And I'm like, squeezing her hand, and she be like, oh, he's harmless. That's small draw, you know, like that. You know, she tried to break the ice with me and come to find out that we were put in the same, uh, um, same group, addiction group. And we went through the program, phase one, two, and three. We are now alumni. So we come back and speak to the groups. So did you know when you were flirting with her in that elevator that she was your wife? No, not exactly. Okay. Well, when did you figure that out? A little while after. A little while after yeah. that, you put in some work. Yeah, put, yeah a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about how, through adversity, you guys formed a union that's clearly powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, besides coordinating all the things you do, you all even coordinate your outfits, as I can see today. Yeah, so. I've seen it's been like that since, since the second day. The second day we met. And um, what it was, when I left the first group, I was like really nervous and and um, I was about to walk past them and something say, just ask them where's a, a meeting, do we know where a meeting at? And I was like, excuse me, do you know where NA meeting is? And he had this big old smile on his face, like I was a piece of candy, talking about, I know where a lot of meetings at, you know? <laughs> and he was just very friendly and he made me feel comfortable. And from that first day, we never been apart. So this was brought together by this building, these people in health, at Healthcare for the Homeless. Yes. What would you say to people who are facing some of the challenges that both of you face? I mean, you have a beautiful story, not only of your own individual accomplishment with recovering and with also getting yourselves together and becoming stable again. What would you tell the people who you felt the same way when you came in and said, oh, I'm not sure if this is for me, I don't know about the title. How, what would you say to them? I'll start with you, Wendell. I would um, have them tell them to hang in there because um, when I came, I had to stand in the line. I got at 5 o'clock in the morning. They mm -hmm. helped me out tremendously, you know, my drug addiction. They helped me with my mental issues. They helped me with my physical issues. And um, it's all good. What about you, Miss Paulette? Oh, wow. Like Wendell says, they help you with everything. It was mental health, physical, you know, it's, it's places where they have programs where they can help you with temporary housing. And um, look, God is blessed. Our ACH, as, as they blessed us, we are blessing them with a clothing ministry. You can come here and get everything. Love, 
hugs, kisses, a husband, I listen to ear, <laughs> look, and a husband. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thank both of you so much for sharing your story about how healthcare for the homeless and the wonderful people who work here helped you. And also your witness of, you know, something happened in your life where you need to get turned around and you're actually offering that service to others. That's yes. a wonderful witness and that's a wonderful way to amplify Baltimore. Good. So yeah. thank you so much, Mr. and Mrs. Muldrow. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Right. It was a pleasure. I hope this show encourages you to support organizations like Catholic Charities and Healthcare for the Homeless and ending poverty and chronic homelessness in Baltimore.